Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in a new series today called Revelation, The Triumph of the Lamb. In the book of Revelation during the tribulation, we're introduced to two people who will come to earth to preach the Word of God. Will they make a difference? Discover the answer in today's message, The Two Witnesses in the Tribulation. The year was 1979. Billy Graham was doing a crusade in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He wasn't going to be there for the first night or two of the crusade, and so Leighton Ford, who worked with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, he was preaching in the crusade before Billy got there. And Billy obviously was the big headliner. He's Billy Graham the evangelist. So Billy came a day earlier than he was scheduled to speak. He wanted to come and come to the crusade incognito and just see what it was like. And so he put on a hat and he put on dark glasses and people didn't recognize him and he sat in the back in the crusade. He was on the, uh, the grass of the stadium. The place was filled with people. Leighton Ford was preaching. He was doing a great job preaching the gospel. And when it came to the invitation time, Billy noticed the person sitting in front of him was, he had been listening intently and he was, uh, he could sense he was kind of under conviction. And so Billy tapped him on the shoulder, not telling him who he was, just tapped him on the sh shoulder and said to him, sir, if you want to go forward and give your life to Christ, I'll go with you. And the man looked at Billy and said, well, no. He said, I think I'm going to do that tomorrow because that's when the big gun comes to town. <laughs> How ironic. It's Billy Graham wanting to go with him, but he's waiting for the big gun to preach. We're in a series on the book of the Revelation, and today we're going to look at two big guns in the tribulation period. We're talking about future things. And the Bible speaks of a future day called the tribulation. It's seven years in duration. And we saw last week that uh, when the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he takes the scroll from the hand of the Father who sits on the throne, he begins to open the scroll and break the seals. And the scroll speaks of the judgments that are coming on planet Earth. Remember we said the scroll, there's different interpretations of the scroll, but the scroll is probably the it kind of like the last will and testament of the Father. It, some have described it as the title deed of the Earth, and the Lord is taking back the Earth. It, it is overrun uh, with the Antichrist, the prince of the power of the air, and the devil, and the Lord is going to come and take it back. And the way he takes back the earth is he does it through a series of plagues, and it culminates in him coming back to the earth, putting his feet on the Mount of Olives, fighting and defeating the Antichrist and his forces at the Battle of Armageddon and setting up his kingdom. But until you get to that place, you have the beginning of the tribulation, and Jesus said that you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and there'll be famines, and there'll be earthquakes, but these are just the beginning of, earth, of birth pains. And so we saw that the first three and a half years, as he begins to open the scroll, he breaks the first seal. It's a rider on a white horse, and that rider on a white horse is the Antichrist. He has a bow but no arrows, and he goes forth conquering and to conquer. And then he breaks the second seal, and the second seal is war. As we said, when you go forth conquering and to conquer, if somebody doesn't want to be conquered, there's going to be a conflict and there's going to be war. And after war comes the third horse, and that war is famine, or, or that plague and that uh, seal is famine. And then the fourth seal is death. And death, and, and the Bible says, and Hades followed after death. Death and Hades go together. Death takes the bodies, 
Hades takes the soul. And then after that, you have martyrdom, the fifth seal. And after that, the sixth seal is a great earth earthquake. And everything seems to be falling apart. And the people are hiding in the rocks and saying to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of the one who sits on the throne and from the presence of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? They're scared to death. And then after the sixth seal, you have the opening, Revelation 8, 1, of the seventh seal. And it's interesting about the judgments of God. There's seven seals, but the seventh seal contains seven trumpets. I think we have a, a graphic that shows that. So these seven seals, well, in the seventh seal, you have seven trumpets of judgment. And in the seventh trumpet, you have seven bowls of judgment. It's just judgment, 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 judgment. It is severe. As we have said in this series, you do not want to go through the tribulation. The first three and a half years are no day at the beach as you have war and famine and death. But when you hit the last three and a half years, that's called the great tribulation. That's where the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 24, if those days hadn't been cut short, there would be no one alive. Everyone would die. Of the seven billion people who will be left on the earth, all of them would die in that short period of time had not the Lord cut those days short. And in this seven-year period of time, we don't know exactly when. Bible scholars will differ on when this happens. I was reading Warren Wiersbe this morning. He says, Revelation chapter 11 the appearance of two witnesses, that happens at the beginning of the tribulation, and they go all the way to the middle point of the tribulation. Perhaps that's true. But the Bible says some interesting things about these two guys, these mighty messengers of God. So if you have your Bible, please turn to Revelation chapter 11, and we'll look at the first 13 verses. It says this, and there was given me a measuring rod, like a staff. And someone said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. And leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. The last half of the tribulation, the Gentiles, the nations, are going to tread over the holy city, Jerusalem. 42 months, three and a half years, or 1,260 days. The Bible uses those different designations for that last half, the great tribulation. And he says in verse 3, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. What we glean from that, those first two verses is that during the tribulation period, the Jews are going to be able to rebuild the temple. Now, I was in Israel earlier this year, and our guide, Pilar, a wonderful lady who has put her faith and trust in Jesus, she is so excited that the Jews are already working. They have a society working for the day that they hope is coming soon where they can rebuild the temple. The Jews haven't had a temple since 70 A.D., when General Titus came in and destroyed the place. And Jesus told them that was going to happen when he spoke to the disciples on the Mount of Olives. He said, they said, hey, Jesus, do you see this beautiful temple? He said, yeah, not one stone is going to be left upon another. And that's what happened. Not one stone was left upon another. It was totally destroyed. They haven't had a temple in almost 2,000 years. But in the day of the tribulation, they get to build a temple. Now, you know if you've ever been to Israel or if you've ever uh, done any study about that, there's a structure on the Temple Mount, right where the Temple of Solomon and then uh, the one Herod built, right where that was. It's called the Dome of the Rock. It's one of the Muslims' most holy sites. They said that uh, Muhammad ascended to heaven from that site. He didn't, but that's what they say, and they build this place. And when you go to Israel, if you go to the Temple Mount, there's a lot of tension there because the Jews and the Arabs uh, and the Muslims, they don't get along. Well, something's going to happen, either an earthquake or some kind of a disaster is going to come, and that Dome of the Rock is going to be uh, obliterated. And with Antichrist's help, 
They don't know he's Antichrist. With this one that comes to power, he's going to help the Jews, sign a treaty with the Jews, create this peace accord with the Jews and the Arab nations, and they will be allowed to rebuild their temple, and they will be allowed to sacrifice again. And the Lord says that in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And in the midst of all that, we read about two witnesses. And the emphasis in the first uh, 13 chapters from verse 3 to verse 13 is on these two witnesses. And so we ask ourselves this question, what do we learn from the two witnesses of the tribulation? Now I want you to see three characteristics of these witnesses so that we can learn three lessons together. First characteristic, they are clothed with sackcloth. Clothed with sackcloth. Look at verse 3 again. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Remember this, a prophetic year is 30 days, a prophetic month, 30 days. So if you multiply that out, that's three and a half years. They're going to have a three and a half year ministry, these two witnesses, unnamed. We don't know who they are uh, because the Bible doesn't tell us verbatim. But they're clothed with sackcloth. You say, what in the world is sackcloth? I have a piece of sackcloth in my hand. If you buy potatoes, oftentimes they're in this kind of rough material. It's called sackcloth. It's what the people, especially in the Old Testament, would wear for two reasons. First of all, they would wear it to represent mourning and sorrow. If you were mourning the death of a loved one, you would often put on sackcloth. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis when Joseph's brothers, you know, they sold him into slavery, but they, didn't, they couldn't tell their dad, hey, uh, daddy, we sold your son Joseph that you love so much, the one that you bought the, the coat of many colors, you didn't get us, we got a big plate of jack squat, you get him a coat of many colors. You know, he, uh, we sold him into slavery. They couldn't say that, so they had to deceived their father, and they took that coat of many colors, and they put blood on it from an animal, and they said, uh, Father, here's your son's coat. What do you think happened? And Jacob thought, for sure, he's been killed by a wild animal, and they said, that's his, that's his coat, and he, he's been killed. And the scripture says in the book of Genesis that J, uh, Jacob tore his clothes, and he put on sackcloth, and mourned his son many days. He put this on. It's a sign of mourning, a sign of sorrow. And the witnesses come, they're wearing this stuff. Why? Because during the tribulation period, it's a time of mourning and it's a time of sorrow. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's distress, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. It's a time of anguish like a woman giving birth, like a woman in uh, experiencing the pains of childbirth. That's how Jesus described that first three and a half years. And so it's, um, this is a, a good garment to depict that. But also it depicts and represents repentance and contrition. When people were put in a situation where they knew judgment was coming because they had been away from the Lord and judgment is coming, what would they do? They would put on sackcloth and sit in the ashes. When Jonah went to Nineveh, he preached a message. You remember, he didn't want to go at first, but he finally went. Uh, God took him a little detour through a fish, and then it got his attention. He's ready to go. And so he goes to Nineveh, and he preaches a message, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And when the people of Nineveh, that wicked city of the Assyrians, when they heard that message, what did they do? They repented. The king, he got off his throne and he put on sackcloth and he sat in the ashes and he proclaimed a fast. Nobody's going to eat or drink. We're going to cry out to God for mercy. It's a sign of repentance. It's a sign of contrition, and you're lowly of heart. The scripture says of Daniel, when the Lord was getting ready to give him uh, the wonderful vision of the future, he said, so I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. The two witnesses, the very first thing we learn about them, 
their ministry lasts for 1,260 days, three and a half years, and they're clothed in sackcloth because this is a time for mourning, for sorrow, for repentance, for humility, for getting right with God because the end is coming soon. Let me ask you, in your sin, do you feel the sorrow from your sin? Do you feel the anguish in your heart? You know how a great way to tell if you're really a Christian or not? Here's the difference. When a non-Christian sins, he doesn't feel much anguish or sorrow about it. When a Christian sins, there's tremendous anguish and sorrow. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of a Christian, and when you sin, the Holy Spirit, you grieve the Spirit, and the grieved Holy Spirit will bring conviction into your heart, saying, you need to get this right. I like what Adrian Rogers said one time. He said, the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, the non-Christian leaps into sin and he loves it. The Christian falls into sin and he loathes it and he wants to get right. Which one is true for you? Hey, salvation comes when you understand, I'm in trouble. This is serious business. As Isaiah said, woe is me, for I am undone, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Lord, save me. I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. That's when true salvation comes. Second characteristic of these witnesses they are spirit-filled and spirit-led. Now, we read in verse 4, because the, the curiosity gets perked up and peaked when you're talking about these two witnesses. And the question that uh, people have had over the, the centuries is, who are these guys? Verse 4 tells us. It says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, if you're like me, you read that and you think, that doesn't help me much. <laughs> how, does that, how does that explain who they are? They're the two olive trees and the two lampstands? Well, that is referring to an Old Testament book, the book of Zechariah, chapter 4. God used those same, that same uh, word picture, the lampstand and the olive trees. He used that when he spoke to Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the prince and the priest and the prince were to get together in Israel to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the political and religious life in Israel because all that got wiped out during the Babylon invasion and the Babylon captivity. And so they got to come back to Jerusalem. Zerubbabel led a, a, a crowd of thousands of Jews, I think it was 50,000, back to Israel to rebuild, back to Jerusalem. And uh, Joshua was, was there, the high priest, and they rebuilt. And the Lord said to him, uh, you guys are like the lampstand. You're like the olive tree. And see, those, the, the olive and the lamp go together. Why? Because the lamp burns the oil from the olive. And so what the Lord is saying in Zechariah 4, the famous verse, Zechariah 4, verse 6 it's not by might nor my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. How are you going to rebuild Jerusalem? How are you going to rebuild the temple? Not by your might, not by your power, by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And my spirit is going to give the oil and going to give the power for the fire to burn again. And so what we learn from about these two witnesses is they're not coming in their own strength. They're coming in the Lord's strength. They are spirit-filled, and they are spirit-led. And their ministry is one of power. It's one of plagues, and it's one of deja vu. To quote Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. I mean, you, you read about them, and you think, I've heard this before. These guys are doing something that I've read before. Look at verse 5. And if anyone desires to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone would desire to harm them in this manner, he must be killed. These have the power to shut up the sky 
in order that rain may not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Well, who did that in the Old Testament? Moses. He was the, the guy that God used to, to call down the plagues upon the Egyptians. He turned the water to blood and all the various plagues that came on Egypt, led by God, led by God's Spirit. Well, Moses did some of these things. And then Elijah, what was the mark of his ministry? Well, he, he said that and prayed that there would be no rain and there didn't fall any rain on the earth for three years and six months. He was the prophet who would call down fire. Now, when it says in verse Five or verse 4, if anyone desires to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. You can get the picture that these guys are like fire-breathing dragons, but that's not what they are. It's not that you get close to them and all of a sudden it's, oh, you know, it's this, this, this breath that just comes out and just curls your toes. It's not like that. It's what Elijah did in 2 Kings chapter 1 where they came to arrest him. And the captain came with his 50 soldiers, and Elijah was there uh, sitting on a hill. And the captain said, thus says the king, you come down, you man of God. And Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down and consume you and your 50 soldiers. And fire came down and consumed him and his 50 soldiers. It's not the fire that comes out of his mouth. It's the word fire and the judgment that he pronounces, and God sends the fire and destroys those who would try to harm them. There's much speculation as to two, who these two witnesses are. They may just be two Jewish guys that God chooses in those uh, days. You know, there are 144,000 Jews who are sealed with the mark of God. We read that in Revelation chapter 7. And God sets apart these 144,000. They're like 144,000 Apostle Pauls, and they go out into the world, and they preach uh, the gospel, the everlasting gospel of Jesus and salvation. But these two, I think, are different from the 144,000. They're given this special job. Some say, well, I think it sounds like Elijah and Enoch. You know, because Enoch, in Genesis chapter 5, he never died. Enoch walked with God, and he was not because for God took him. He, he left this world not through the grave. He was taken out. Elijah never died. He left this world in a whirlwind. And remember, he dropped his mantle, and the mantle fell on Elisha, his, his underling. Well, those two guys never died, so some people say, I think the two witnesses are the two guys who never died, Enoch and Elijah. But Enoch, there's not a lot that's said about Enoch like there is about Moses. And when Jesus was on in his earthly ministry, when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he peeled back the veil of his humanity, and he let Peter and James and John see his glory and see his deity, two men appeared with him, Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. They were with Jesus as he was getting ready to go to the cross. And I personally believe that's who we're reading about. It's God sends Moses and God sends Elijah. Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, chapter 4, verse 5, the Lord says this, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And I think Elijah comes, and I think Moses is here, and their ministry is so much like the ministry that they had when they were on the earth. And their ministry, although it's filled with power and it's filled with plagues and it's filled with things that we've seen and heard before, the main thing about the miracles that they do, and the miracles are judgment miracles and plagues. Nobody likes those. I mean, we're not talking about feeding the 5,000. We're talking about... Uh, you know, casting a plague on the 5,000. The thing that they do, all of it, just as Jesus' miracles, all of them were for one main purpose, to point the way, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. And so their ministry is to turn men to the Savior. That's what they're designed to do. For three and a half years, they are preaching 
and they are doing miraculous works designed to turn men to the Savior. There is grace even in wrath. During the tribulation, as the seals are being opened, there's wrath coming from God. And it says at the end of Revelation chapter 6, the people recognize it, saying to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the Lamb, for the day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? The tribulation period is God pouring out his wrath. And in the midst of wrath, you have these two mighty messengers of God that are pointing the way to Jesus. And the world is going to hate them. Have you noticed how our world is beginning to really, even here in America, beginning to really hate a Christian who stands up to be counted and says there is no other way, Jesus is the only way? The world, we're, we're starting to feel a lot of uh, persecution coming to the church. In this day, it's going to be turned up uh, to a whole new level. And so these guys, people are going to want to kill them, but they can't kill them. And they don't want to hear the message because it's a convicting message. Remember in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen got up to preach and he preached and he called those Jewish religious leaders out and he said, you are the guys who keep resisting the Holy Spirit. And they were cut to the quick and what did they do? They held their hands over their ears. They didn't want to hear and they rushed on him with one accord and they stoned him to death. That's what's going to take place in Jerusalem as these two guys are preaching. People are going to be like, I ain't going to kill you, but they can't. Why? Because as they rush to get them, fire comes down from heaven and kills them. Nobody can harm these guys as they preach their message, telling people to turn to the Savior. You know, it's kind of like Elijah when he preached in Israel. Israel was turning to the Baals, and Elijah called the big showdown on Mount Carmel, who's God? We're gonna see who is God. And uh, he said to the people, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If God is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And they had their big showdown. The God who answered by fire, that was God. And when the end of the showdown came, Baal couldn't answer by fire, because Baal's not God. God answered by fire, and the people saw when the fire of God fell, they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. But now people during the tribulation period, they're not that uh, prone to say, uh, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Even though all these miracles, miracles of judgment are taking place. Something to remember about God and the fact that there's grace even in wrath. Exodus chapter 18, verse 32. The Lord says this, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. God doesn't want to destroy people. God doesn't want to pour out wrath. God wants to save. God is a savior. We sang about the Lord Jesus today, about he, he's a savior and he's a king. And the Lord would much rather see people turn to him, repent, and live so that he doesn't have to wipe them out in judgment. You know, when we think about these guys being spirit-filled and spirit-led, now they're different from you and me. They're different from anybody else in this, this time of tribulation. But the principles still apply. God wants you to be spirit-filled and spirit-led. He wants me to be spirit-filled and spirit-led. Just they're, they're called the two witnesses. We're called to be witnesses. Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. We witness in two ways, by our life and by our lips. It's not your life without your lips. It's not your lips without your life. It's those things together. The way you live, the way you conduct yourself, the way you treat people, and what comes out of your mouth as you tell people about Jesus who's mighty to save. Those two things. 
So we shine for Christ. We share the story of the good news of Jesus Christ. We share about his love, and we share the bad news that unless you receive Christ, you're going to die and go to hell forever. Why? Because you're a sinner before a holy God. That's why. Because all of us are where Isaiah was. We just don't recognize it. Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Everyone you meet outside of Christ, he's in serious trouble. She's in serious trouble, but so many of them don't see it, and they think they're okay, but they're not okay. And unless you repent, Jesus said, you will all likewise perish. Hey, what do we see about these guys? They're clothed with, clothed with sackcloth. They're spirit-filled and spirit-led. And thirdly, they fulfill their mission. They fulfill their mission and their ministry. I like what it says in verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony. People are trying to kill them. People hate what they have to say. But they can't hurt them. Because the fire that falls, because God protects them, and God protected them all the way until the end of their 1260 days, until the end of their three and a half years, and then God allowed them to be harmed. Listen, the man, the woman, the boy, the girl who is sold out to the Lord Jesus, you are indestructible until God says, you've completed what I wanted you to do. We can be confident. You know, you, sometimes you'll have people that will go into the mission field, and they'll go in very dangerous places. And it can be really hard for mom and dad when son or daughter says, I want to go to the mission field into a very difficult place in, uh, in a Muslim country. But listen, if God calls that boy, that girl, then you can know that they are going to be indestructible as long as they're doing what God wants them to do. And when God's done with what he wants them to do, he'll take them home. So you don't need to fear. You fulfill your mission. They did. But then what happens? Look again in verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast, first time we read that word in the book of the Revelation, the beast that comes up out of the abyss, the beast is the Antichrist, will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Now, we might not get it if it just said mystically was called Sodom and Egypt. We say, I don't know where that is. Where their Lord was crucified, we know where that was. That was Jerusalem. And so they're going to be killed in Jerusalem. And it says, and those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. The beast, the Antichrist, is going to wage war with them and defeat them. God will allow the Antichrist to defeat them. And the people will ooh and ah over the Antichrist. We're going to talk next week about him. Revelation chapter 13. And the refrain concerning the Antichrist is this, as the people worship him, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? Man, he took out the two witnesses, the ones that no one could mess with. He killed them. And so the Antichrist kills them, but they don't allow them to be buried. They let them just lay in the streets. You know, we've seen some video from ISIS and other uh, terrorist groups. What do they do? They take our soldiers or, or some American, and they have their dead bodies there. They're desecrating the dead body, and they, they don't bury them. They'll, they'll burn them uh, before the cameras or something like that. But they, they want to mock and ridicule and laugh and all those terrible things. It, to a Jew, the ultimate diss would be desecrating the body taking a dead body and not giving it the proper burial. Well, here you have the two witnesses, three and a half years. These guys are some kind of messengers, some kind of prophets, but they're just dumped in the street. People come from everywhere to see these guys. Why? Because they were tormenting the whole earth, the Scripture says. They hated them. 
They wanted them gone, and the beast kills them, and so they are so glad. And the people will rejoice and celebrate their deaths. Look at verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry. They're going to have a big party, and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. I mean, they were casting out down plagues any time they desired. And so there was great torment. That word torment is the same word that's used in Revelation 20, verse 10, that talks about hell and the torment in hell. These people were having hell on earth from these two witnesses, and so when they die, they throw a party, and they celebrate, and it's like Christmas time. They give gifts to one another. Now, you remember the movie, The Wizard of Oz? Has anyone in here other than Quinn Stanfill never seen the movie, The Wizard of Oz? I'd encourage you to watch it. It's a, it's a classic from... Uh, 1939, I think. But you remember in The Wizard of Oz, the house, Dorothy's house falls down on the wicked witch of the West. And they sing, the little people, they start singing, the little munchkins. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Witch, oh witch, the wicked witch. Ding dong, the wicked witch is dead. That's the same kind of deal. Ding dong, the witnesses are dead. Which witnesses? Those two guys that tormented us, they're dead. And they're so excited and they're singing and they're having a party and Jerusalem is filled with uh, people that are enjoying themselves. The people rejoice and celebrate, but the Lord gets the last laugh. The Lord will be glorified. And it says in verse 11, and after, these, and after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were beholding them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. You know what God does for these two witnesses? He gives them a very mini rapture. You know, Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Jesus went up to heaven in a cloud. And here these guys are dead, and everybody's celebrating. Ding dong, the witnesses are dead. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of the celebration, and it's seen all over because it'll be on every news program and everyone's viral video, it, it, everyone in the world will see it. Then all of a sudden, the life comes back. The breath of God comes into them. They begin to start moving, and their uh, rigor mortis goes away, and their bl uh, blood starts pumping again, and all of a sudden, they stand to their feet, and people are scared to death, and the Lord says, come up here, and they're taken to heaven. The people hear the voice, and they see them go up to heaven, and it says in verse 12, and their enemies beheld them. That word means to consider, to acknowledge. And here's what God is saying, I believe, from this rapture of the two witnesses. The Lord is saying this. There came a rapture of my church before all this started. And you guys explained it away. See, when the rapture hits, we don't know when that's coming. It could come at any moment. When that hits and hundreds of millions are gone from this earth, just like that, well, the earth is thrown into chaos. You can't take out 400 million people and there be no ripple effect. There are going to be ripple effects and, and families are going to be uh, torn apart and, and people are going to have the question, what happened? Where did they go? And no doubt the Antichrist will come up with uh, something that sounds so good and so plausible, something that sounds like this. Those people were taken away in judgment. God was judging them. Why? Because they're holding us back from progress. 
Those people who believe this old book, those people who say there's only one way to heaven, uh, they were taken away. They were taken out. But God is saying, uh-uh. And you're going to see it and behold it yourself because I'm raising up my two witnesses and I'm telling them a voice from heaven, come up here. And I'm taking them to heaven. They're not going down to hell. And it is going to be an amazing thing and the people are going to be scared to death. From a, a party to a panic, from great festivities to great fear. And all that happens just like that. And then there's a great earthquake. Verse 13, and in that hour there was a great earthquake. And a tenth of the city of Jerusalem fell. And 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. You know, I read that and I thought, well, that's not very many. Because it says when the fourth seal was broken, death, and Hades followed after death, that a fourth of the earth died. So a fourth of the earth, we said that was like 1.75 billion people. Well, that's a bunch. 7,000 is not very many. Why does it say that? Because it says this, and it says 7,000 people, and the word in the Greek means named men. Known people, 7,000 people who were named, who were known, because it's going to be a big party. The celebrities are going to come in, and the dignitaries are going to come in, people that the world knows. Those 7,000 died in the earthquake. And when that happens, there is tremendous fear that's thrust into the hearts of the people, and they give glory to God. Now, I don't know if they repent. It says over and over in Revelation, especially in chapter 16, when the bowls come out, the bowls of judgment, that they did not repent. They're gnawing their tongues in pain, and they curse God and blaspheme God. They don't repent. So maybe they're just giving God glory, but they're not really giving God their hearts. Or maybe it could be some there in Jerusalem say, this is of God. I'm going to follow Jesus. Maybe that happens. But you know, in, in a service like this, as we preach and we talk about judgment that's coming, deservedly so, on sin, and as we said last week, the fire fell on Jesus on the cross at Calvary. And if you will put your uh, faith where God puts his son, you'll put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the fire won't fall on you because it fell on Jesus. But if you don't, the fire is going to fall on you. So here you are, and you say, well, what do I do? So I want to speak to two groups just in closing. First group, you're not a, you've never given your heart and life to Jesus. You're just kind of thinking about this stuff. Or you have, a, you have a knowledge of God in your head, but you've denied the power thereof. It's not real in your heart. That's the way I was for years and years. I believed all these things about Jesus, but it was in my head. I believed in Jesus like I believed in George Washington. No one in this room denies that George Washington was a father of our country, first president of the United States. I mean, he lived. He's real. How many of you are trusting George Washington for anything? None of us. We don't trust him for anything. He's just a guy in history, a guy in the book. That's the way a lot of people believe about Jesus. He's just a guy who lived in history. You're not trusting him for anything, much less eternal life. And see, this is a wake-up call for you. What are you going to do? Because if you reject, if you reject, if you reject, you say, well, I'll get saved during the tribulation. You might. You might. And let me tell you something. For most people during the tribulation, you will pay with your blood to put your faith and trust in Christ. You come in just a moment when I give the invitation, you come to give your heart to Christ, we will cheer you in that day. They won't cheer you, they will chop your head off. They don't cheer you, they chase you so that they can execute you. It's serious business during the tribulation. And so here you are, and you say, well, I'm not sure about my relationship with Jesus. As one man told me when Tim Lee was here, he said, what he said that cinched it for me, 
He said, I was 90% sure that I was saved. And Tim Lee said from this platform, if you're 90% sure you're saved, you're 100% lost. You don't want to go into eternity 90% sure. You want to be 100% sure that you've given your, heart, given your heart and life to Christ. And so my friend said, man, when he said that, I knew I needed to pray and get things right. And he went home to tell his mom, and he led her to the Lord. That's us. So that's the first group. You're not saved. You need to be, and this is not meant to scare believers. The book of the Revelation is not meant to scare believers, but it's meant to scare unbelievers. Because if you can read this, knowing that this is going to happen and not be scared, you have room to rent upstairs unfurnished. I mean, it, it, this is not something to laugh about. This is something that's going to be serious and horrible. So what's the second group of people? The second group of people is the group where you know you're saved. You know that Jesus is real in your heart. But you're, you're not sold out to him. I mean, you're just singing the Doobie Brothers. Jesus is just all right with me. Listen, Jesus, doesn't, he's not interested in being just all right with you. He is God. He wants you to sell out to him, to shine, to share, to be the witness that he wants you to be. He wants you to be filled with his spirit. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So you need to abide in me so my life will flow through you because if you don't do that, live a surrendered life to me, I can't use you. And God wants to use you. That's an amazing thing when you think about it. God wants to use you, little old you, little old me. We have nothing to offer God except surrender. And that's all he needs. The best ability is simple availability. It's just saying, Jesus, here I am. Use me. Send me. I want to shine and I want to share until you come again. My friend, the Lord is coming soon. And now is the time, if you're not ready, to get yourself ready. Simply pray this prayer from your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost. And I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose again from the dead, and that you are Lord of all. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on your screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart today, the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org.